welcome to this new session of our book launch series. At this time, I'm particularly happy to have here with us Maya Horn, who has just published not just new, but a first book. And a very beautiful first book, I must say. And uh, also a mythical book, because I think that all narratives, narratives about masculinity and emasculation have some sort of Olympian flavor. Well, flavor perhaps is not a word. <laughs> <laughs> but you understand what I mean. I am not going to talk about this book, although I could, because first, I have read it, and second, I have enjoyed it. And third, I have a great admiration for Maya. So there, there are three wonderful reasons to talk about it. But if I did, then it would be a very long, uh, and I don't, I'm not a specialist in any case in, in Dominican uh, and Caribbean history and culture in general. So I would rather uh, ask our guests today to do this job, uh, who, and they will do it in a much, much better way. And for this purpose, uh, the introductory remarks are going to be in short, I mean, uh, 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 what I respond the, the chair of the Department of Spanish and Latin American Cultures, Garner College, will, will do these uh, introductory remarks. And we have two wonderful guests to present the book, Kayana Glover, who is a professor in the Department of in the French Department uh, at Garner, and who is the author of 18 Unbound, and many, many other things that I am not going to uh, enumerate for you, but she is also a wonderful actress. But he, <laughs> she works in interpretive literature, post-colonial studies, and so on. No, you, you, you were going to like this. Don't take my word for it, just look. <laughs> and Carlos Ethena, who is Carlos Ulises Ethena, talk about myths, uh, who comes from Rutgers, he is an associate professor at Rutgers, and who works in a critical theory in social sciences, and uh, who is also a very important specialist in Caribbean and queer studies, and in, in, uh, therefore in the field in which Maya is also uh, working. So uh, with no further ado, I just simply Thank you, Well, thanks for holding this once again. Uh, thanks to all of you for being here. And I, too, am very happy to be part of the presentation of Maya's first book because for some mysterious reason, I have spent the past two years of my life immersed in Maya Horn scholarship to the extent that I'm thinking of adding Maya Horn studies to my field of <laughs> So I am. Uh, and so I thought I could best open this presentation by placing the book in the context of the rest of her work and in that way making it also a little bit of a colleague presentation since in academic institutions we unfortunately not always have a comprehensive grasp of each other's intellectual personalities. So something I should let you know to start is that I don't know why the title Masculinity after Trujillo it's inexplicably hard for me to pronounce. <laughs> Something about my particular Puerto Rican accent seems to be making it a tongue twister for me. Um, but something more important I should let you know is that this book is more or less the first part of what can be considered, or I consider, a biology, if there's such a word, together with her second manuscript currently being reviewed by a publisher, Queer Dominican Epistemology. The two books were simultaneously produced, and they are very much two facets of a holistic research project that I'd like to tell you a little bit about. As I'm sure that Kayama and Carlos will tell you more about, uh, masculinity after Trujillo is grounded in a far-reaching claim about the role of Rafael Leonidas Trujillo's dictatorship 
and the foundation of a cult of hypermasculinity that is essentially imbricated into the very understanding of Dominican nationality. Quite against the critical grain, Maya maintains that neither the long-lasting autocracy nor the paternalistic and sexualized discourse to which it gave rise can be understood simply in terms of Latin American traditions of dictatorship <coughs> or machismo. Instead, Dominican masculinities have to be at least partially recognized as a response to emasculating U.S. occupation and the enduring influence of colonialism. In addition to providing much basic information on the Trujillo period, useful for newcomers to the fledgling fields of Dominican studies, this book is anchored in cultural studies methodology and in dialogue with important research in neighboring disciplines, or if you will, in the broader interdisciplinary cultural studies field, such as Carlos de Sena's own pioneering tacit subjects, Dominican transnational identities, and male homosexuality in New York City, published by Duke in 2011. As such, masculinity after Trujillo is the most valuable in drawing attention to how the regime supported its very concrete exercise of power with rhetorical and semiotic acts without which that power may not have been equally effective. To successfully impose a national identity to which even Dominicans against whose interest it work ascribed was a task painstakingly executed through public languages, for example, laws and proclamations, rallies and speeches, or the control of media such as radio and newspapers by the system's ideologues. And Maya examines in depth the reach of this political discourse, as well as its subsequent engagement by men and women of letters who in literary texts written in the Dominican Republic or in its US diaspora either challenge or sometimes unknowingly and unexpectedly perpetuate the dictatorship's paradigms. Beyond her novel argument about the gendered nature of the dictatorship's idea of nationhood, it is this relational understanding of political, literary, and other languages not often interpreted as a common discursive formation with far-reaching influence upon a nation's history that is, in my opinion, one of her most important contributions to scholarly discourse, not only in Dominican and Caribbean studies, but on gender and sexuality, Latino studies, and these days, perhaps always last, but definitely not least, the good old study of literature. Masculinity after Trujillo is a groundbreaking book because it takes critical distance from tendencies that have weighed heavily on these fields during the last 10 years to contest the belief that hegemonic masculinity is somehow a vernacular practice that sets Latin America apart from the more advanced gender egalitarianism of Anglo-America. This group brings together Maya's experiences as a European scholar in an American institution who has lived in the Dominican Republic, as well as studying it. And it is such a highly personal product that I will tell you in strict confidence that a scholar who reviewed the manuscript wrote that this is a book that simply needed to exist and could at this stage only have been written by Horn. <laughs> to me, <laughs> to me, this is some of the most incredible praise an author can receive. I'm currently working on my third book after 24 years in this profession, <laughs> and it is really only now that I feel of my own work that it has sprung not just from what I learned in my research, but from who I am. The fact that someone could say this of such a young scholar or relatively young scholar <laughs> really speaks volumes about the uniqueness of her intellectual vision. It is precisely the questioning of essentialist notions of race, class, gender, and sexuality against the shifting grounds of geocultural and geopolitical forces that links masculinity after Trujillo to her second book, Queer Dominican Epistemologies, which I can pronounce perfectly. <laughs> um, where the first book focuses on gender politics imposed from above, 
The second centers on the gender discourse of a range of Dominican and Dominican American cultural producers, including not just writers this time, but visual and performance artists. And here Maya returns to her MA training in performance studies to integrate it with all the other fields that she was already addressing. The producers she explores showcase in both life and work their own non-heteronormative or queer subjectivities in ways that are not reducible and are even contrary to the LGBT discourse of the global north. And her analysis counters the manner in which they have been narrowly framed, even through well-meaning structures such as anthologies aimed at making them visible. Of special interest is Maya's theoretical formulation of the strategic concept of an epistemology of silence related to epistemologies of relation and of survival versus prescriptive calls for speaking or coming out. Her polemical claim is that in the Dominican Republic, silence has not always equaled death. And that the artists she studies have deployed counter hegemonic practices of the body that do not pass through the obligation to surrender to codified forms of sexual self-disclosure. Once again, Maya thinks of Dominican gender politics in a dialogue with transnational forces, critically mediated by the circular migratory context of the Dominican diaspora. Maya's books complement a solid record of shorter format publication, not only of scholarly articles included in well-known periodicals like the Latin American Literary Review, GLQ, a journal of lesbian and gay studies, or the Latino Studies Journal, but also of less classically academic pieces on Dominican and Latino visual art that have appeared in United States publications such as Articles or Winwood, the art magazine, or in Dominican Republic periodicals like Artes, La Revista Especializada in Arte Caribeño, as well as in art catalogs. In her academic articles, she explores the problems of sexuality, nationality, or high and popular culture that interest her in different contexts, including Puerto Rico, the Cuban diaspora, and Guatemala. But while the inquiries of various critical works may be analogous in the way they respond to her interests, the answer arrived at is always culturally specific and stems from the material rather than being imposed on it. For example, her article on performance artist Regina Jose Galindo's problematization of the body's role in performance art understands the conceptual as firmly grounded in the contextual, in this case, a denunciation of the political, social, and everyday violence faced by Guatemalan women. Maya's most recent article, Dictates of Dominican Democracy, another tongue twister, <laughs> published in the journal Small Acts, a Caribbean platform for criticism, seems to sketch a new direction in her research in that it bypasses attention to gender issues to attempt an explanation of the obvious disparity between prevailingly positive world perceptions of the Dominican Republic's development and its actual political and economic realities. Nevertheless, there is significant continuity with her previous work in the connections she draws between the lip service paid to democratic language by the US during its early 20th century Dominican occupation, Trujillo's adoption of the same dogged discourse of democracy, she calls it, and a resulting, I'm sorry, a resulting rhetorical legacy that to this day continues to be taken for granted at the international level. Maya's other recent writings on art, which include essays, exhibit reviews, and interviews with artists, together with her own curating of the Dominican York Proyecto Grafica exhibit at Barnard in 2012, show both the scope of her explorations beyond narrowly defined specializations and her commitment to being engaged with producers and audiences beyond the academy. Her critical inquiry is built upon the understanding that culture and embodied subjectivity are not only performative and relational, but framed by specific socio-historical contexts and power relations, national and transnational. 
In her years in this profession, she has become a go-to scholar that even artists and curators seek out for engagement and validation. All of her scholarly and general works build upon each other in order to craft the ambitious outline of a long-term research project. Now that masculinities after Trujillo is out, you all have the opportunity to connect with what she has to say in the deep way that I've been lucky to do already. <laughs> um, so I thank you here for being tonight, and uh, I thank Kayama and Carlos for um, their own insights about the book, and I welcome you all to talk to Maya, because she really has a lot to say <laughs> that is very interesting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wada, and thank you, Jesus, for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, my remarks will be somewhat shorter and a little bit broader. I am not uh, in the Spanish or Latin American studies department. I come to you from the French department, bizarrely, I am here. Um, but I, I wanted to start by saying that the Caribbean is a funny uh, it's relatively small. Right? There's about 2,000 miles of distance between its furthest points. Um, and yet, it's somehow incredibly difficult to travel there. And, and I don't mean to travel to there, that's obviously easy enough, but it's incredibly to travel, difficult to travel once you are there, right? to move around in that region. An, an anecdote, I was um, on leave in the fall, and I had this wonderful idea to attend three academic events that were happening in the Caribbean. I will remember this, how excited I was with my so it was the uh, association, written, the association for the study of the worldwide African diaspora that was happening in the DR. Then a that camp then a that camp Caribe um, that was happening in Cuba, and then the Haitian Studies Association annual meeting that was happening in Haiti. And so I started a planning on my my leave that I would spend this week in the Caribbean, moving seamlessly from one continent to the next, immersing myself in Utopia of Caribbean studies in all parts of the region. Um, and the scheduling stars had aligned in my favor. They were literally one after the next over the course of one week in November. It couldn't have been more brilliant. Um, but that ended up not being possible. <laughs> I simply couldn't figure out a way to get from one island to the next, or to, from one country to the next, I should say. At least not for any reasonable price or with any measure of efficacy. As it turned out, and, I, and I, have, I went back to this printout when I was trying to work out the travel arrangements, my best option would have been to fly commercially from New York to Santo Domingo, from Santo Domingo to Miami, uh, from Miami to Havana, round trip via some dodgy charter service, <laughs> then from Miami to Beau Prince, and then from Beau Prince back to New York. Which, and this is with me sleeping in the airport at least once. <laughs> so, uh, so that was the story. So, and bear in mind that these countries are about as proximate as you can get. Haiti and the DR actually share a fairly <laughs> small island next to Cuba, right? Um, but as I said, the Caribbean is a funny place. Um, it is balkanized by language and by logistics. Direct and indirect legacies of colonial and post-colonial imperialist practices and policies. So for me, what is truly wonderful about Maya's book is that not only does it take into account the ways and the extent to which these policies and these practices of the so-called first world, of the US in particular, the ways and extent to which external policies and practices limit and condition cultural realities in the Dominican Republic, but the book also travels in a very real way. It travels across the borders of Hispaniola, and it travels out into the wider Caribbean in important ways, I think. Not only does masculinity after Trujillo tell a compelling and a deep historical story of Dominican gender reality in all its complexity, but it also suggests a model, I think, for regional scholarship. As I said, I'm a Haitianist. I think mainly on the other side of that border that divides uh, Hispaniola. And Maya's book truly gave me questions to take to my texts and to take to my context in ways that yielded things that I hadn't found in these texts before. And so I deeply appreciated it for that. Her book offers provocative ways of thinking me and of thinking every other part of the Caribbean, I would argue, not only as so many singular nations, but as iterative spaces. Right? 
competing islands and being this robot would say, except mine has figured out the gender in a much more compelling, <coughs> convincing, and, and sophisticated way. Maya's implication of the wider Americas into her thinking about the two thirds of that one island she happens to know best, her way of, of thinking the Americas is a call, I think, to pay attention to the more and less subtle ways that preconceived notions of tradition and modernity of masculinity and of humanity are too often left insufficiently interrogated by the <coughs> scholars themselves. Several decades ago, Edouard Bélisson wrote in the Discours Antillais, the Caribbean Discourse, of the quote, undeniable reality of a common Caribbean culture that had emerged from the shared history of the plantation. But for Glissant, although this reality remained uh, virtual, although it was, it, it remained virtual, although it was inscribed in facts, right? In, in, in everyday comparative realities in various islands. But it was endangered. That commonality was endangered by the logistical and the epistemological forces that were to divide the island from one from the others. And so it hadn't yet been inscribed in real consciousness. So for me, if I'm thinking as popular and as, as widely circulated as have become images of the Americas as productively creolized, inspiringly open and hybrid, a fully transnational Caribbean reality has proven a lot more difficult to enact than it has been to imagine. Historically and contemporarily, the diverse geographies of the Americas remain largely permeable to one another. Masculinity after Trujillo attenuates that impermeability. The critical path that it traces is one I think many of us should pay attention and follow with greater attention. It's a book that challenges not only the sedimented discursive patterns that run through the histories of the Americas, but also the critical paradigms that participate in the sedimentation of gendered commonplaces into the present moment, into the post-colonial moment, into the 21st century. Over the course of the last couple of years, I read this book in bits. I don't know if I would get a, a certificate in my own studies, but on this book, I, I could, you know, we could be in class together, maybe teach a class together. Um, so I read it as Maya was writing it in various working groups um, here on campus and elsewhere. I read this book while she wrote it as a colleague and as a friend. Um, and then a few weeks ago when a published copy arrived in my campus mailbox as this beautiful gift, um, I read it again. And I read the whole thing together, not one night, but over the course <laughs> of a couple of days, I just read through this thing that she created. And this time, I read it as a scholar. And I took notes, and instead of taking them for her, I took them for myself. And I was very grateful that I did so. Pretty much kind of condemned to <coughs> irrelevancy. And then she, of course, 
by then had published foundational fictions and the rest is history, right? So um, it's really interesting so many years later to, and I've been doing my own studies myself too, so I'm, I'm, on, the, I'm on the bandwagon here uh, with a the, uh, cheerleading team. Um, it's, it's gratifying to have masculinity after Trujillo join a growing body of work um, and have Maya, Maya's voice officially kind of enter um, a group of, of younger scholarly voices who are addressing these issues <coughs> in English um, for both a Dominicanist audience in both languages, but more importantly, for the wider Caribbean studies audience. So what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about what I think are the main contributions of this book, and um, I'll try not to give away too much um, so that you'll go do some of the work of actually um, reading it. But it's one of the, you know, Maya starts very evocatively the book by talking about Dominican president, uh, former Dominican president, Hipólito Hipólito Mejia's ubiquitous 2012 campaign slogan, Llegó Papá, that is here. <laughs> and and you know, there's still traces of Llegó Papá all over Santo Domingo. Um, in his unsuccessful attempt to marshal the votes to return to the presidency at the time, the references to Mejia's slogan are a useful point of departure to explore the conditions for the resilience of traditional modalities of patriarchal and heteronormative masculinity in Dominican politics and literature. Horn's argument in, in the text, uh, Masculinity after, after Trujillo, is that the modality of masculinity indexed by the slogan corresponds to a modern masculinity developed in discourse and enacted by Dominican dictator Rafael Leonidas Trujillo Molina. Trujillo, who governed the country from 1930 until his assassination in 61, looms large in the Dominican imagination not only because of the degree to which his rule outlived him within the institutionalized state apparatuses, but also because of the power he had to shape modern and contemporary notions of Dominican identity in state as well as in quotidian practices. It is important to highlight that masculinity after Trujillo moves decidedly away from exceptionalist portrayals of the dictatorship and its leading figure, and instead focuses on the study of the masculinist legacies. Um, I think of it as the Trujillo effects of the Trujillato in relation to the way that we might think of Colian effects. I mean, it really is that reverberation. In relation to key historical and political reference that the dictator himself elaborated in his discourse and performance of masculinity. One, Trujillo's masculinity and its aftermath as a result and as a response, at least partly to forms of imperial masculinity present during the United States occupation from 1916 to 1924, um, the first of two US occupations. The, and number two, Trujillo's brand of militarized masculinity as itself being shaped by his military training in the context of the first US occupation, so he is a product of the US occupation. Instead of leaning on the, no, on the notion of Trujillo as a traditional Latin American dictator, Horn moves away from these characterizations and instead urges us to account for, quote, how transnational and imperialist forces, international political discourses of sovereignty and European and American racism, unquote, reform the articulation of the kinds of masculinities associated with the regime. Um, in this sense, I see Horn's work as being very much in dialogue with older scholarship by folks like Gina Ta well, a slightly older scholarship by scholarship by, by folks such as Gina Candelario, who are trying to think about the question of race that they are not just as the sort of exceptional case of racist self-hatred that you know a lot of outsiders to the Dominican um, context think of it as, though it is that. <laughs> that's part, but that's not the whole story. So it, we are a hot mess, but we're actually <laughs> a hotter mess than people make us out to be when we just talk about being racially psychotic. It's, it's worse than that. Um, but instead to try to think about Dominican racism and anti Haitianism in relationship to two important sedimentations of imperialism. One of them has to do with the 19th century um, reverberations of the um, aftermath of the Haitian Revolution and Haiti's presence um, within the islands, uh, within the island. 
uh, and the power that Haiti had, and also the U.S., the large U.S. presence. So what Gineta, what Candelario does is uh, stage a kind of triangulation that I hear also um, throughout, or that I read also in, in Maya's work. So to think of um, gender and racial formations in the Caribbean context is always in dialogue, not in, with multiple reference, not just with one, um, but with several. So, um, my study astutely centers on literature, a discourse she adequately associates with the letrados of the writers and other artists, literary artists working within or against the establishment in the Dominican Republic because of the crucial role that literature has played in helping to think through the discursive work of the dictatorship and its legacies. Quote, um, Dominican letrados' role as record keepers and guardians of the country's collective memory and of the regime uh, of the regime, Horn explains, in fact, he helps to explain why the Trujillo dictatorship is arguably the central, and I just lost my mind, um, is arguably the central theme of late 20th century <coughs> Dominican literature. And in fact, those of us who are familiar with the Dominican literature can only um, perhaps agree that um, the Trujillo dictatorship and the body of Trujillo, the body of the dictator, continues to be an obsession uh, among writers. So one of the things that she sets up to do is um, she, the first chapter and the second chapter talk about both the question of how Trujillo sets up a particular series of discourses in this way and, and then how that is followed by the work of some national, important nationalist um, writers like um, Mario de los Magiolo, Marcio. Marcio de los Magiolo. So there's a question about how Trujillo sets up a certain uh, set of codes, how some of that stuff is incorporated into the, discurs the discursive work of the intellectuals, of the letrados, and then um, how the aftermath of those particular discourses and formulations of masculinity appears in the work of Marcio de los Magiolo, among other writers. Um, so the second chapter, um, it's titled One Fallows for Another, and of course I'm thinking of Doris's work here, plus the Victorian Political and Literary Culture. Um, that's where she starts talking, uh, mind in this case, um, about the continuities um, in the work of hegemonic Dominican masculinity in the depiction of men um, in the novel, in the novels that she that she addresses. Um, citing literature as an important archive where some of these traditions are preserved. Is, uh, is an important um, strategy to carry out in the Dominican context, particularly because of the highly prized location of literature and intellectuals who engaged in the making uh, of literature um, in, the, in the preservation of uh, those legacies. So if Maya had been studying um, street merengue or something else, some of these articulations and their reverberations would have appeared, but there's something about the purchase that the Ciudad Letrada has on the Dominican imagination that's absolutely crucial to the kind of diagnosis of a hegemonic form of masculinity that she's attempting to stage here. Um, the third chapter, which is um, called Engendering Resistance, and it concentrates on Ilma Contreras, um, it actually stands on its own and is a pioneering contribution to the study of a terribly important and very neglected Dominican narrative artist. In particular, um, mine is focused on the thematic content and focus on, uh, of Contreras' uh, dictatorship novel, La Tierra Está Ramando, um, a work that tends to be considered an important contribution to the genre, but that is all but ignored in surveys of the genre um, of the dictatorship um, novel, is absolutely essential. And one of the things that happens in the even the, the whole question of narrating the dictatorship novel is that a lot of the narratives produced by women disappear. So does that surprise anybody? No. Um, part of this neglect, as Horne explains, has to do with how clearly this novel moves away from the more traditional narrative obsession with the figure of the dictator and his virility or sexual exploits. Um, there's a it, it, there's an, an obsession with Trujillo's body, but it's uh, it's really um, below the belt where the obsession really kind of goes wild. Um, and it's Trujillo and Porfirio Rubirosa. The, there's this, this whole thing around 
Um, and somebody should do this uh, as a study, the penal obsessions of Dominican intellectuals. With. You're not going to do it. But somebody else, not me, because I have, I have other penal obsessions. And I have other penises to think about. <laughs> That's boring. Um, an important way, so what particular concern is the articulate for her in this chapter about Contreras is, an, is with an articulation of how quotidian practices, once appropriated by the Trujillo regime, such as the fictive kingship relationships of uh, compadrasco or chisme, uh, might serve purposes other than those of population control, which is what they serve, the purposes they serve during the dictatorship. An important way of outlining these concerns, as Horn suggests, is through Contreras' anatomization of the condition of women's socialization in Dominican society and their very different standing as intellectuals and as artists in the later, latter moments of their life of the regime. By centering a female protagonist and observing a studied avoidance of overly sexualized scenes throughout the novel, Horn suggests that Contreras, in fact, accomplishes a, quote, significant sidestepping not only of the Trujillo's discourse of heterosexual virility, but also of the excessive sexual detailing in the most canonical Dominican dictatorship novels. I mean, this is, it, it, it really is pretty outrageous um, in, in, the, in the predominant strains in the uh, literature. It is ironic and telling, um, as Maya notes in the book, in this section of the book, that Contreras' success in this important exercise <coughs> in, in sidestepping prevailing literary discourse about the dictatorship is one of the key reasons why La Tierra está bramando has been neglected by the Dominican literary establishment. So it, there is a kind of studied refusal to perform the kind of um, you know, graphic forms of masculinity and sexual detailing in the novel, and that in a way contributes to the neglect that it has received. Um, the last two chapters of the book concentrate on the work of Rita Nia Hernandez and of Juno Diaz, and if they direct the the glance um, outward. Um, while Horn highlights the importance of an operation of estrangement of common sense views of Dominican masculinity as enacted through the hyperbolic vision of the missing father in Hernandez's second novel, Poppy, she connects her analysis of this novel to a more ambitious agenda characterizing a uh, characteristic of Hernandez and other artists of her generation uh, to challenge traditional Dominican notions of normativity while providing new frames and models to think identities in the Dominican context. A deeper irony surfaces in um, Horn's astute critique of Juno Diaz's The Brief Wonders Life of Oscar Wilde, as well as, well as his more recent short story collection, This Is How You Lose Her. Uh, while readers might expect that Dominican diasporic writers such as Diaz to offer a critique of the gender and sexual status quo in Dominican society and its diasporas, the acclaimed author's work produces some critical perspectives while remaining enamored and committed to conventional views of gender, sexuality, and normativity. And I think this is a standing problem for Juno Diaz's work. Um, as much as some of us may hate to admit that that's what's going on there, that's it's there. So, you know, got to deal with that. Go to the shrink. Um, what is particularly troubling to Horn is not so much um, that Diaz pr will produce such characterizations, but that the critical reception of his work uh, tends to adopt an uncritical view of such depictions and map them onto a progressive vision of Dominican gender and sexual relations as they're plotted to narratives of migration. Uh, this encounter, and I'm citing Maya here, of backward Dominican and implicitly modern American gender patterns, this avows how historically these formations have never been as separate as they now appear to US mainstream critics and, and readers. And we could really spend a lot of time trying to think about both the literary output and its reception in the case of Juno Diaz. But I think it's important that to highlight here that one of the major accomplishments of, of this book is not only to, um, to think through um, the implications of the afterlife of a, a regime um, you know, beyond the, the, the figure, the actual um, you know, physical figure of the dictator disappears, um, but also to, to note the extent to which a whole corpus of um, a whole horizon of scholarship might be opened by um, looking at the crevices and the gaps that are wide open the moment we begin to shift away uh, from the body of the dictator, which I think this book gives us um, some clues um, as to how to do. So I want to thank Maya um, not only for the opportunity to, to talk about her work here, but uh, for 
giving uh, myself and all of, you know emerging generations of Dominicans um, more uh, food for thought, more avenues for innovative um, scholarship and um, imaginative engagements with a corpus um, of, um, of literary expressive practice that we, that we really care about. Thank you.
So I don't want to say much more. Um, this book was a long process, <laughs> but uh, it was uh, not necessarily a very strategic book because I there were three other chapters um, about Dominican political culture that I decided to take out um, and that I'm not now publishing slowly. So the dictates of Dominican democracy that was in there too. So because I really started getting really interested in how these notions of gender and sexuality traffic between literary and political discourses and really trying to understand, you know, um, basically like kind of the political problems that our Dominicans in everyday life are really, really concerned with, like really trying to understand, at a, I guess at a discursive level, but also the really real effects of that kind of discourse and thinking about like why are there not more, what is hindering kind of the formation of coalitions or collaborations around race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, even labor movements, which historically haven't been particularly strong. Like, what what is hindering these kind of um, collaborations? And, and and something has to do with the way of political signifiers that exist or that have been also appropriated, particularly by the Tupiato, in ways that really empty this out of meaning in a way that has lasting effects. So terms like justice, equality, democracy. Um, you know, there are, there are other terms. That, um, that one can think of. So that's something that I'm still thinking through. But I'm I'm very happy it's out. I'm very very happy you're all here. And I don't know if you have any questions. That I'll make them answer. <laughs>
the kind of ideologies of the, the Pleiado and how his power structure worked. There's sort of this like focus on his persona as if his power merely hinged on his sort of personal biography, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it doesn't really allow for like a broader understanding of how he restructured in many ways power relationships in the country. But because there's obsessive focus, like you must you must know how he died or who he had sex with. You know, that kind of focus. I think the the one figure, the most horrifying figure figure in that novel is Balaguer. Um, because Balaguer, actually, the, Bala the Balaguer of Vargas Llosa does approximate, in a very eerie way, the workings of power that Balaguer was able to mobilize. Where, until the very end, Balaguer, I mean, if they could take him to the Vatican and make him into a saint, they would. They just won't do that because, I don't know, they'll think, it's, you know, what is, what is the loophole? <coughs> A renegade Jesuit, like, <coughs> but uh, the, the 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 most terrifying and the three is the clown, but again, it's really the guy who stayed, and it is reductive. Um, I think one of the problems with Trujillo is, as a figure um, in the Dominican imagination, or in, in in the in the sort of literary imagination, right? And this is this would be inclusive of non Dominicans who wrote about. Him including by Gaspiosa, but other folks as well, uh, who wrote biographies of him, um, is the extent to which the histrionics of the figurehead um, distracted from the both the horrifying actual acts of terror, but also the, the overarching eeriness of the control that apparatus that was deployed, that continued and that in some ways actually is beginning to be felt transnationally um, through the, the inheritor of this, um, you know, someone who's out there, who has a foundation that sends stuff and gets people to go abroad to, yeah. Who shall remain in English, but everybody knows. <laughs> so there's a, there is an afterlife to this, and I actually think that the current, um, some of the current leadership of the country is a recycling of some of these with a 21st century new liberal twist. So, um, but very, some, there are some pretty widely Maybe as loudly heard, but they're but they're out there, and there's also, I mean, there's 
a lot of published also in the Dominican Republic that doesn't necessarily come out, but if you go to the bookstores there, it's amazing the amount of books that are, are, are published and about social sanity, political sanity. So there, there are a lot of different voices um, that are not necessarily the loudest. So I did, you know, as Wada kind of said, this is kind of the book that where I was really interested in looking through gen notions of gender that are, are really kind of hegemonic and how there's the, the after effects of them, particularly also at the political level. So in that way, I would say I didn't address these other forms of Dominicanidad. But I'm hoping that my second project is very much about recuperating all these, you know, is part of that project, right? So what some of the alternatives that have emerged, and they're very strong. They're not sort of weak notions. They're just not the ones that are necessarily circulating at a more official and, I guess, elite level. So this is sort of, I would say this is my hegemonic project, and I don't have my hegemonic project. <laughs> yes. Well, I have questions that are full of spoilers, so I'm just going to make just one probably. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoy your chapter of Genoa, because as Carla said, somebody had to say that. And Yeah. 
have a sufficient, even critical or conceptual vocabulary to map some of them out. But yet, I do, I do have a clear sense of just saying, oh, we're all modernizing, and and and, and, and this is, and this is a backward tradition we need to overcome. That 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 framework is not explaining a lot, yeah. right? That's just not. It doesn't have a lot of explanatory power. But what problematic notion or notion that we should challenge um, persists? But others do change. You know, the role of women and political representation. There are things that have changed. It's also interesting to look at what's not changing them. But I think where I always end up in the end in this book and the other one is I'm like, oh, let's all get a better understanding of how local and global or you know more broadly transnational forces interact. And and I, I think I'm still looking for other, you know, what other people are writing for sort of critical models to think through that, perhaps in a slightly more systematic way, right? So because for now, like you know, and I'm debating in my head, will I forever only study Dominican literature, culture, and politics, or will I move on? And, and you know, I, I actually think I will continue. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, that's a difficult. It's a it's difficult, a difficult question. question because some of us are committed to this, but the but we have the because we were just talking about this earlier. Um, you know, we are Dominicans. We're committed to. The scholarship, but how how do you do that without ghettoizing yourself? In even today, I mean, some of us need to be able to be conversant with a broader Caribbean and Latin American um, corpus. Yeah, and, and two brothers are just unexplainable. Right. Just because it was going to be in conversation in a productive way with this larger discussion. Um, and I think what has to happen for Dominican scholarship, among other scholars, because Haitianist scholarship is, it has a very similar set of problems um, within the Francophone Caribbean corpus. Um, 
the question of the insularity, how do you move outside of the example to create, to stage a conversation that allows your, um, you know, even across languages. There are people like Gloria Wecker writing uh, about Suriname, or Omisek and Omisek Natasha Zinsley writing about Suriname. And there is a kind of staging of the particularity of the case in relationship to these larger conversations that we are beginning to see in Caribbean studies done much more and more with the smaller island nations and with countries like the DR that are starting and the Haiti that are starting to kind of set up the conversation in a slightly different way so that we can have a more productive collective conversation. Um, but you have to, I don't even know, I mean, my, in my case, I, I was, I, Duke was the first press. I was, it, it just, it just happened. I mean, and I, I feel very privileged to have knocked on that door and, and it opened, even though they don't, I don't, I think they're publishing now a Dominican Republic yes, reader yes. or something. I didn't hate it either. Right, yeah. right. So they, so they don't, they don't, they don't have that many books on Dominican um, studies. And so I'm glad that they were supportive of this project and there was never a hesitation about the project. Um, but I think that it's really about building the critical mass um, and figuring out how other scholars are staging the conversations about their specific, because we Caribbeans have this problem. It, and it's a problem with people who do work on Central America. It's not as much of a problem for folks who are working in the larger countries that have their own sort of larger traditions, their own longer standing universities. But for Latin American, it's in general, it tends to be a problem. It's an, une an unevenly distributed problem, but it's there. And, it, and the question becomes, how do, we, how do we convince publishers that the, the conversation is worth having regionally and in a larger so, while at the same time existing in nation language departments right. that privilege and attention to a particular linguistic group, right? right? So that discourage the trans, the trans, right? The trans linguistic and trans colonial. Right. So, right. Something of a catch 22. So maybe it's that. grabbed it away from me and said, you do not criticize somebody's newborn baby. <laughs>